Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I see participants are logging in, so let's wait maybe a couple of minutes until everybody's online. still people logging in. I'm just starting a few minutes waiting for your participants that are still joining in. Hi, everyone. Uh, yes, we're going to start in one minute. See some participants from Bosnia, Tunisia. Hi, welcome. Hi, everybody. participants from India. Hi, hi, Shak. Okay, I think we can start. Um, so first of all, greetings from Geneva and welcome everyone uh, to today's webinar on climate change negotiations and health. My name is Patricia Martin de Briones. I'm a program officer at Unitar's Division for Multilateral Diplomacy. On behalf of Unitar, I would like to extend your warm welcome and thank you for joining us for today's activity. Uh, the webinar is the first of two webinars uh, that are offered as part of the WHO UNITAR and UNCC Learn online course on climate change negotiations and health. The course is now open um, for registrations and is also free of charge. So we kindly invite you to, to register if you are interested and want to defend your knowledge in, about the course topic. I will give the floor to my uh, colleague, uh, Christina Picacabas, in a, in a minute, who will give you more information about, about the course and how can you enroll. Uh, but before that, um, I wanted to briefly uh, go through today's agenda. Uh, firstly, I will give the floor to my colleagues from UNCC Learn and WHO, so they can say a few introductory remarks. Then we will start with the presentation that will be facilitated by the trainer, Dr. Uh, Valentin Ade. Um, the presentation is divided in three blocks. The first block is on claiming value in negotiations. The second block is about how to create value in negotiations. And the third block is on characteristics of negotiations in politics and diplomacy. Then after the presentation, we will open the floor for questions and answers, and then we'll close the webinar. If you want to ask any questions during the, um, the, the Q&A block, please don't hesitate to pose your questions in the Q&A forum. 
you will see there's an icon that's called Q&A. And there you can pose your questions and then um, the trainer will address these questions at the end of the, the webinar. To streamline uh, communication because you're a very large group of participants and our time is limited, uh, kindly note that only those questions that are posted under the Q&A forum will be answered. Um, so please don't use the raise uh, your hand icon as we will only take questions that are posted in the Q&A forum. Um, if, if you want to ask any questions, please um, remember to insert your name and country. So this way the, uh, the trainer can address, uh, can address directly to you. Um, to avoid any background noise and avoid overloading the Zoom meeting, please don't turn on your camera and your, and your microphone if possible. Um, uh, the web, today's webinar will last 90 minutes and it will be recorded. Um, also, the webinar will be streamlined on Unitar's Facebook um, account in case you want to follow it via, via Facebook. Uh, so without uh, further ado, I would like to, to welcome my colleague, um, Cristina de Cacabas and, and give the floor to her so she can say a few words up on behalf of UNCC Learn. So Cristina, the floor is yours. Thank you, Patricia. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Cristina Ricacavas. I work as a Green Development and Climate Change Specialist at UNITAR, and I'm also the coordinator of the UNCC Learn program. For those of you who don't know it, UNCC Learn is a collaborative initiative bringing together um, 36 multilateral organizations for the promotion of climate change learning. Its secretariat is hosted by UNITAR, and it is supported by the Swiss government and uh, UN partners. First of all, I would like to thank very much the World Health Organization and the UNITAR for the great collaboration over the past months. They made it possible to develop this training program on climate change negotiations and health. It is increasingly evident that environmental challenges, including climate change, have an impact on human health reinforcing existing risks to our well-being. Therefore, this program aims to inspire professionals, particularly in the health and the environment sectors, but also academics and the global public, to address health within the UN climate change negotiation, as well as within national policy processes. It also aims to inspire consideration of climate change in health policies. As briefly mentioned by Patricia, this program includes a free online course and two webinars. And the online course is launched today on the UNCC Learn e-learning platform. I will briefly share my screen for you to see the course on the platform. I think you can, you can see it. So um, this course is free, it's self-paced, and can be taken at any time. It comprises of six lessons, which you can see here, covering an introduction to climate change and health, the history of the UN climate change negotiations so far, entry points uh, to incorporate health within upcoming negotiations, as well as recommendations to, um, for a healthy and green recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. The lessons include uh, different activities, exercises, case studies, videos, as well as links to other resources for additional information and learning. The course can be also downloaded in PDF format for offline study. Upon successful completion of the course, uh, participants can also take a quiz on the platform and if successful within three attempts, they can then download a UN certificate. There is also the possibility for participants to share their input and feedback, uh, for instance, uh, how they intend to use the knowledge acquired or what other topics they would like to learn about. Um, again, to conclude, our many thanks to our partners for this collaboration, which builds on previous successful collaborations for the promotion of uh, learning in the area of climate change and health. We hope you enjoy the course as well as the webinars. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, Christina. Thank you for your welcome remarks and also for sharing with, with us a glimpse of the of the course. I'm sure uh, participants will be interested to know more and hopefully this will foster registration. So thank you, Christina, again, that was very helpful. Uh, now I would like to give the floor to uh, Elena villalobos Pats, who will say a few words on behalf of WHO. So Elena, the, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Patricia. Um, I'm very happy to represent WHO today. Um, and I think this is a very important day for us, uh, not only because this important training is, um, is, is launched, this resource that we think is going to be very useful, um, also because this represents a, a very successful collaboration with our colleagues in UNITAR. And the most important thing I would say is because all of, of you are connected. Um, WHO has been following the negotiations for over a decade now, and I think at the beginning, it was kind of a struggle for us to try and um, make uh, people and negotiators understand why health had to be represented in the negotiations. Over the years, we've seen how this has changed, and now people are becoming more and more aware, not only about the impacts that climate change is um, causing on the health of the populations and health systems uh, around the world, but also about the opportunity that they have to really increase the, the, the commitments from countries to reduce their emissions. And this is the key message that we would like to consider and uh, we would like you to take uh, home. Basically, health is not just a sector that is impacted, it's also a great opportunity to make others realize there are options for um, improvement. So if people realize that, for example, cutting their emissions they will not only save money, but save uh, millions of deaths that are happening every day, every year due to exposure to air pollution. We can convert this really into, into action. Um, this year is an important year because in the run up to COP26, uh, WHO is working very closely with uh, the COP26 um, team. And basically there will be several initiatives on health, one of those being one on aiming to, to increase climate resilience of health systems, but also um, reduce their emissions. So that's why we are very happy with this uh, tool. We think um, it is really an opportunity to increase commitments from countries to move towards resilience and um, sustainable, uh, environmentally sustainable health systems. And um, I would like just to thank you again for being here and for taking this, this course and for converting yourself into agents of, of, of change. So thanks again to everybody for being here. I hope you enjoyed the webinar. Thank you so much, Elena. Thank you for your introductory remarks and for highlighting the importance of the uh, current climate change negotiations in health. And uh, I'll also thank you for your continuous collaboration to both WHO and and you assist and learn uh, thanks to this collaboration, this webinar is it's taking place as well as the e-learning course. Um, so now without further ado, um, we'll give, like, I will give the floor to, to Dr. Valentin Ade, who will facilitate the webinar. Uh, Dr. Ade uh, teaches negotiation at uh, different universities, for example, the University of St. Gallen and uh, Sciences Po uh, uh, Paris. He also leads training workshops uh, for UNITAR in the field of negotiation skills, as well as for other public and private entities. In the next few months, he will be a visiting professor at the Dispute Resolution Research Center, uh, the Kellogg School of Management at Northwestern University. Dr. Ade holds a psychology PhD on negotiation training effectiveness from the University of uh, Lunenburg. And he also received a joint Master of Science in Management from ESCP Europe, Paris, and TU Berlin, as well as a Bachelor in International Affairs from the University of St. Gallen. So, uh, Val, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Patricia. And also thanks to Christina and Elena for your um, words. Yeah, dear participants, it's a great pleasure to, to be working here with you today. We have 90 minutes or maybe now 80 minutes, 75 minutes. And there are five concepts that I would like to talk about with you. Five negotiation concepts. And Patricia has mentioned my background 
is partially in negotiation training effectiveness. So what I do is I look at the literature of negotiation, so the academic literature, the practice literature, and I try to understand which concepts are most helpful for negotiators. And then I spend a lot of time talking with practitioners and ask them, does this really work when you try to apply this? Or is this just something that people who write books and who do um, academic research talk about? Yeah? And my special interest in climate and health, or in particular in climate, has something to do with my practical background. Before doing this focus on um, negotiations, I worked for five years in the international solar PV industry, doing finance and business development. And one of the things I've been doing now with UNITA is develop a simulation of a climate club negotiation. Climate club is a concept that maybe some of you have heard. It was pushed, for instance, by William Nordhaus, who won the 2018 Nobel Prize in Economics. And I will say a couple of things about this later. So five negotiation concepts. And the first, of, the first two of them have to, do, have to do with claiming value. So in negotiations, we want to do two things. On the one hand, we want to get a lot, or some people maybe as much as possible, or other people maybe something for ourselves. We want to bring something home for our governments, for the parties that we are part of, our families, and so on. And then the second thing that we want to do is we want to make the pie bigger so that the others can also take a lot home. And ideally, in the end, they can take a lot home and we can take a lot home. And the relationship is so good that we trust each other and that we want to be in contact with each other for more time in the future. In reality, however, negotiations often get complicated. And in particular, the part with claiming value gets into the way of successful negotiations because people want to get as much for them often or at least something for them. And then they use techniques that are perceived by the others as unfair. So we will look at two techniques that have been proven to be very, very effective in these negotiations, and then briefly talk about, should we actually use them or should we just know about them so that we can identify them when the others use them? Before that, I would like to show one quote by a negotiation researcher and then ask you if you agree with this quote or not. It's William Zartman. And he said, oddly enough, negotiation is not most frequently taught in international relations. Oh, no, I see something coming up here on my desk. Um, okay, that's the poll for you. Um, oddly enough, negotiation is not most frequently taught in international relation courses. It is much more common in business and law curricula. IR theory and IR texts bypass negotiation, focusing on explanations for war, overlooking the fact that negotiation in its many forms takes up most of the time and effort of interstate relations, diplomacy, and foreign policy. So the question to you is, do you agree with Mr. Zartman or do you disagree and say, no, I think that people who have an IR background, they, they learn a lot about negotiations in their studies. Okay, now 100 participants already have answered. Thank you, thank you. And we see a diverse picture, but there seems to be a tendency to agree. So over 50% agree, nearly 20% strongly agree. And then some people say they are undecided and very few seem to disagree. Our answers here might depend also on where we have gone to university. Some countries have a more stronger focus on negotiations than others. So these concepts that we speak about today, 
therefore might be familiar or might be known to some of you, while for others there might be new. And the goal here is to present these very common and, and, and well-used um, concepts and then to later discuss them. So for some of you, the, the first part will be a repetition. So you will be able to refresh your knowledge. For others, you will be able to learn new things. And then in the second part, in the Q&A, we will be able to talk about them. Now, at this point, I would like to make a little experiment and I would like to divide, ask you to divide yourself into two groups. The first group is the group of participants who are born between January and June, so in the first half of the year. And the second group then from July to December. And now I would like to show one slide only to the January to June people. So if you're born in the second half of the year, please, for the next 45 seconds or so, look away from the screen. This will help us to learn um, something about one negotiation concept. So the January to June people, now please look at the screen and read the text that you are seeing here. Twenty more seconds. Your answer doesn't need to be perfect. Just choose whatever number comes to your head. Okay. Then please write this number down on a piece of paper or somewhere on your computer. Don't share it yet with the group. And if you are in the January to June group, then now please look away because now the experiment is for the July to December people. So if you're born between July and December, now please look at the screen. You will see a text. Read the text and write down a number. Twenty more seconds. Again, your number doesn't need to be perfect. Okay. Now I would like to ask all people born between January and June, please share your numbers via the chat function. Just type in the number. Mm -hmm. Okay. 50, 50, 70, 25, 159, okay. 250, wow, well, that's an outlier. 15, that's also an outlier. Okay, so we see a very diverse group of numbers here. Now, I'm not a mathematician or an engineer, but I would guess that maybe the average of the numbers that we have seen here is around, what could it be, maybe 80? Okay. Um, I would be happy to, 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 have, to ask somebody if you agree, but as we have so many people here, this might be a bit difficult. So let's say the average that we have seen here of all of these numbers here, might be 80 or maybe 90. And now please everybody from group number two, July to December, share your number. Okay, thank you. Again, we are seeing very different numbers. My personal feeling is that now the average is lower than of the first group. I think it might be around 50. 
if you strongly disagree with my math skills, now please speak up because um, this is important for the next part of the course or of this, uh, this exercise. Here. Okay, then let's assume that the first group had an average of 80 and the second group had an average of 50. Now let's add the documents that you have seen. First, we see here the July to December people, so the second group. You read a text here about vacation and Chesoland and so on, and you saw that the owner says 85 British pounds. And at the same time, you were told that this number is not relevant for you. And you concluded that the average is 50. Now let's look at the first group. Let me see how I can change the slide here. I think I need to... Okay, the January to June people, you saw the same text. There was only one difference, and this difference is the number. You saw 185 British pounds. You also saw that this number is not relevant. So you both saw the same text. The difference was January to June group, so a high number, and the July to December group, you saw a lower number. You both were instructed not to believe this number in any way, yet we see that the first group has an average of 80 and the second group has an average of 50. So this number that was not so supposed to influence you, influenced you. And this is known as the anchoring effect that has been studied many, many times. And we just replicated this effect here in this um, exercise. And the anchoring effect is relevant for negotiations because the first number that is mentioned in a negotiation influences what the people in their heads think is a fair or a normal result. So if you start a negotiation with mentioning a high number, even if this number is not relevant yeah, or not believed, not trusted, it will influence people to agree on final prices that are high. And if you use a low number, then um, on final prices that are low. So if the seller makes the first offer or if the buyer makes the first offer, it can be really important on how aggressive this offer is. Based on this insight here that we just replicated, it would be advised to always make the first offer and to always use a strong anchor in negotiations. However, there are risks associated. So I would like to show you a slide that mentions a couple of risks. I will be going back and forth between showing slides and talking to you directly a couple of times. So the anchoring effect, and I will repeat this because it's important, the level of first number mentions a fixed reference points in people's heads. This points has a massive influence on the decision-making processes of people. The anchoring affects also experts, not only lay people. So real estate agents get anchored by irrelevant numbers and also judges. There has been a study made with German judges who threw a die before making a judgment and they were influenced by if the die showed a high number or a low number. Yeah, only to a small extent, but still measurable. Is relevant, but we should pay attention when we try to use the first anchor because there are risks associated with it. Our counterpart may get angry or sad if we use an aggressive first number, or they might think that no deal is possible. So if we do a climate negotiation and we say that we should not, we should not go above 1.0 degrees of global warming, the others might think that we are not serious. Yeah? So we're using crazy numbers. So if they say, if they are representing the coal industry and they say we shouldn't go, we should not go above 10.0, um, climate people might get angry and leave the negotiation. So if we use anchors, we can get something from the other side. We can influence what they think is fair, but we can also lose our reputation. Anchoring is important in negotiations as there's always somebody who at some point has to use a number. So maybe um, you want to take 30 seconds to think about one situation of an upcoming negotiation where a number needs to be mentioned and you think about, do I want to mention the number or should, should I let the other party mention the number? And what influence might this have on the final agreement? Let's take 30, 30 seconds for this right now.
The anchoring effect was apparently the favorite negotiation technique of former US President Donald Trump. He was known for making extreme demands at the beginning and then slowly making concessions away from them. And the idea is if you make this strong opening demand that in the end you will be at a place closer to your favorite than to theirs. If you don't want to use the anchoring effect, and if you say the other party should make the first offer, that is okay. But please keep in mind that whatever they say will anchor you. So you will be influenced by what they are saying. There is no way to start a negotiation or any um, exchange of possible numbers without anchoring. And this leads us to the second point. The second technique for claiming value in negotiations is framing. And also in framing, it's nearly impossible to talk about a situation without using a certain frame. So many of you are already familiar with framing. You might work a lot on text and think a lot about single words that you use. So I'm not trying to, to offer any um, new concept here, but I would like to relate it now in particular to negotiation to also refer to some research. So framing, there are many different definitions. And one definition that I personally like is that framing is selecting true aspects about a fact that gives a certain perspective on this fact. So everybody knows the story about the glass of water that is filled to 50% of its capacity. The people who say it's half full, they are right. The people who say it's half empty, they are also right. Yeah. Everybody highlights one true aspect and still it looks like they are disagreeing with each other. And framing is important in negotiations because by using a certain frame, just like by using a certain anchor, we influence how people see things. So negotiations often is something good or bad that is framed, just like with the glass of water. And Kahneman and Tversky, they have made research on medical treatments and they have told people, imagine you have this condition, the probability of survival is 80% if you use our treatment, or they have said to another group, the risk of dying is 20% if you use this treatment. It has been the same information, yeah, 80% survival versus 20% dying. It's the same information, but it's presented from a different perspective. Or if an organization say, we plan to be CO2 neutral by 2040, it's the same information as saying, we want to contribute to global warming until 2039. But obviously, the first has a much more positive twist to it. Euphemisms often frame, yeah. If the stock market falls, people don't speak about losses, they speak about a price correction. The military sometimes uses the language that others consider to be um, distasteful when they speak about neutralizing targets rather than killing people. In negotiations, it has been studied, how do people react to the same price for something when it is once framed as an offer so we offer you a health insurance plan for 1,000. Or when it's framed as a request, if you want to have our health insurance plan, you have to pay 1,000. And it was found that people prefer to respond to offers, even if the number that they need to pay is the same. Politicians are often very good at framing agreement versus disagreement. If you meet somebody and you disagree with them, you can always highlight the 1% that you agree on rather than pointing out what you disagree on. We frame by using words like climate crisis versus climate policy crisis. And then there's something called moral framing that I believe is very interesting. It's used for political debates. If you're interested in this, I can recommend watching this video here. Now we have talked about two techniques that many of you will already know for claiming value. It's anchoring and framing. And now I would like to do one more exercise. And for this, please imagine that we are in the same room now. Um, or how many people are we? Nearly 200 people. We will be at the same room. And we would stand up and start walking around. Um, now I see the poll again. OK. Um, now, please imagine that we stand up and walk around and you look for somebody who is as tall as you are. This is an exercise that had been used for decades in many negotiation trainings. It was originally developed by the program on negotiation people of Harvard University. 
And it's normally played in a room, but you can also play it in your head. Please imagine you standing close to somebody who has your size more or less. Now I would ask you to go to a desk and put your hand on the table or the elbow on the table to be more correct. One person from one side, the other person from the other side. And you act as if you were going to start to play arm wrestling. Now I show one slide with simple instructions. Please play these instructions in your head. for 40 seconds. So you're there with one person and you play the game, collect the points that you get. 20 seconds left. Okay, thank you. If we were in one room together, I would now ask you how many points did you get? And 95% of the people get zero points, one point, two point, three points, something like this. That there are 5% of the people who get 20 or 30 points. What do, the, what do they do? They don't see this as a zero sum game. They don't press their hands against each other. They cooperate. They go in one direction and the other direction back and forth. Because this is not arm wrestling. This is something that looks like arm wrestling, but point two clearly says, you want to get as many points for yourself as possible. You're not interested in anyone else. So if you cooperate with the other person, you can get many points and they can. And this, in, this exercise is interesting because it shows how we often approach negotiations. We approach them as zero. Some games, if the other people get points, that's bad for us. And that's why most of us only use the techniques of anchoring and framing in negotiations, and then some general, you know, sweet talk and, and try to persuade each other, but they don't use techniques for cooperation. And many of you already know these techniques for cooperation. I will talk about three of them briefly. The important thing is not knowing them. The important thing is being able to use them when we are in a heated situation, when we are angry, when we are cognitively challenged. Because it's like smoking, Smokers know what they have to do, yeah? Stop smoking, most of them want to stop smoking. The challenge for them is to do it. And that's also the case here with, with these techniques for creating value in negotiations. And the first technique has to do with the situation. It can be brought in contact with this. And here I would like to ask you a question. Imagine this honeymoon couple asks you for an advice on what to do. The bride would like to spend the honeymoon in the Swiss Alps in a small cottage. In particular, she looks forward to spending time in the mountain nature, hiking and watching free living mountain animals. The groom, however, would like to spend the honeymoon in a comfy wellness hotel at the sea. In particular, he looks forward to the hotel, the spa, I need to put the pole away, um, a spa, a beauty massage studio and the animated social games in the evening. What should the two of them do? Let the bride decide where to go, ladies first. Let the groom decide, gentlemen first, or whatever it might be the name for this. Spend one week as the bride prefers and one week as the groom prefers, okay. Cancel the wedding and search for better suited spouses. Maybe that's too late already. Now you have to push it through. Or some of you say, I have an alternative proposal that I would like to share with the group. So the biggest group of answers here is spend one week as the bride prefers and one week as the groom prefers. This is often referred to as a compromise. Yeah? You can't have everything. And now if we have more time, I would love to talk to those 21 of you who have an alternative proposal. Um, in order to save us some time, I would like to present what often is then said by these people. And what also is backed up by research. It's you don't have to do either or. You don't have to either go to the Swiss Alps and then stay in a cottage or to the sea and stay in a hotel. 
you can look at the priorities of the people. What is most important for these two negotiators? Now, this is a fictitious example. We don't know a lot, but we see here that in particular, the bride is interested in the mountains, and in particular, the groom is interested in the hotel. So one way to approach this with a win-win mentality might be to say, okay, why don't you get what is most important for you for the two weeks? If I get what is most important for me also for the two weeks. And this might mean that they go to a wellness hotel in the Swiss Alps. Then everybody needs to make a concession, but the concession is on the issue of lesser subjective importance. This sounds a bit technical now, but if you think about cases where you are talking about going to a restaurant or doing some project, it's not always that all issues are of equal importance for you. So some are more important than others. And normally, if there are many issues, what is most important for you would, may, would not be most important for the others. Or maybe it is, but then somewhere down in the hierarchy, you find things that you can trade. And that's one of the three techniques for creating value in negotiations. It's called log rolling. So to summarize again here in a slide and also in one picture that I found online, log rolling works this way. You say, which issue is most important to me? Which issue is most important to you? Okay, if I can help you with one thing, please help me with another. So you are trading concessions based on different priorities. And in your negotiations in the field of health or climate, if you want to use log rolling, it's important that you identify the negotiation issues. And so the groom and the bride, they would cut down the big topic, honeymoon, into geographic location and out of accommodation, in way of accommodation, and then to understand the priorities. This is pretty easy if we would do now a couple of examples in theory, but it's very difficult in real life because in real life, we don't have our priorities so clear and they change all the time. We walk into a negotiation with friends about what kind of restaurant to go to. In the beginning, we think we only care about whether it's Chinese or Italian, but then we understand, okay, we also care about who's joining us. What time is it? And how will we split the bill? So we might in the beginning have a plan but we should never fall in love with this plan. Don't fall in love with your preparation. That's something that some of the negotiation people say. So if we want to make the pie bigger and reach agreements that are better than compromises, what we want to do is don't meet in the middle. Don't go seven days to one place and seven days to the other place. But before we do it, say, okay, let's talk about what kind of issues are we having here? What is important to you, what's important to me. But then also be careful because it's not always that even if the other party understands what is most important for them, that they will say it. Sometimes they might also fake to have priorities or they, if we share our priorities, um, believe that we are faking them. Yeah, that's the concept of log rolling. Those of you who have been in negotiation training, I'm sure that you have already done exercises on this. It's easier if you have only two issues. It's more complicated if you have 10 issues to identify okay, the exact priorities and then to exchange it with the other party. The second tool for creating value in negotiation has to do with an iceberg. And let me again share my screen. That's one of the most important examples of negotiation theory. And I also believe of negotiation practice because it can be translated into practice so easily. This is what the so-called Harvard concept that relates to a book from 1981 um, is at least to some extent about and that what is associated with it. This book, Getting to Yes from Fisher and um, Yuri and then later on also joining them for one of the later versions, Patton. This concept says that there are things that people say, I want the orange, but that these things don't reflect what they really mean. So if you look at an iceberg, you see the upper part, but you don't know what is below. As Fisher and Yuri and Patton then wrote, interests, that's the part below the iceberg, 
motivate people. They are the silent movers behind the hubbub of positions. Your position is something you have decided upon, your interests are what caused you to decide. So people say one thing, but we often mean another thing. And if you negotiate with somebody, you might often have a problem to give them what they ask for because it clashes with what you are asking for. Yeah, two sisters say, I want the orange. Then the only way to make them happy is to cut the orange in half. And that's one of these compromises again. What we want to do as negotiators is understand why do people have these positions? Why do you want the orange? Maybe one sister needs to peel for some science project in school. The other sister wants to eat the orange. And then both of them can get 100% of what they want. It sounds very easy in this example. In reality, it's, 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 it's way more complicated. Um, so let's look at some examples of possible positions that you might encounter in your work in climate and health and talk about what kind of interests might be behind them. So let's assume that you are in a climate negotiation and somebody says, we have to be able to run our coal, our coal power plants until 2045. We can't stop them, you know? This is just 2045. Then you might say, okay, 2045, hmm, I've learned one thing about anchoring. So maybe this is just an anchor that they are using. Or you might say, okay, 2045, that's their position. What is their interest? And as with this iceberg, if you see the position, you don't know what the interest is. In this case, the person might have an interest related to financial aspects. So they might think that coal power is, for whatever reasons, more cheap. They might have an issue regarding to technology and say, well, this, this has to do with our grids. We cannot have solar or so on. Or they might also have other things that they maybe don't want to mention. So for them, energy production might be about identity. So if you go to a coal country and you tell people there that they should stop using coal, this is not only about finance or technology. This is about who they are in their heart. And so they might um, be yeah, sad to hear your point. And if you want to reach an agreement with them, you have to move beyond this position. Okay, we can't do this. And understand, is it for them about identity, about money and so on? And then we can think about ways that we can make, we can make them happy, even if they stop their power plants earlier. So this is a bit tricky. Um, it's important to listen to other people in negotiations. But that doesn't mean that we listen to what they say. We want to listen to what they mean. And if somebody says, I want the orange, maybe they mean, I want the peel. If somebody says, not until 2045. Maybe they mean, I want to be taken serious with my culture. I want to be honored. And then maybe one way to address this is to speak about closing them down earlier and making some museums or making some you know, public holidays related to the identity of this region that has to do with coal. Okay, so um, that was one example. Here are some other examples of positions and then possible interests that might be behind this. So if somebody says we cannot afford all these new investments in health infrastructure, maybe their meaning, for them it's about something else. It's about being re-elected. Yeah? Or if an individual says, I think rich people should get better health care than poor people, maybe this is not about ideology. Maybe this person just says, I want to be healthy and I happen to be rich. So if you want to make your negotiation partner happy, and you have to if you want to reach an agreement, you need to address these interests and you need to identify them. And that's one of the most difficult things in real life, although it's maybe easy in, in examples in negotiation courses. So how do we move from positions to interests? There are a couple of things we can do. We can, at the negotiation table, ask why questions. Why do you want the orange? Why do you say that we cannot stop these coal power plants? Sometimes it helps. And if we ask many why questions, we might come to, 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 to understand, OK, this is something that they really want, and this is something that we can give them. Or we might make similar offers and say, which of these offers might be most interesting? Or we might say, okay, I have had this in initial position, but in reality, my interest is a bit more complex or different. 
also we might listen to their body language and really go beyond what they say to what they mean in, uh, in this non-verbal way. What we can also do is we can talk to third parties. If you want to understand a country like North Korea, you can ask North Korea or you can talk to diplomats from China and maybe they will share some insights. If you want to talk to my brother about how he's feeling, you might ask his wife because she might have some very deep insights that he might not um, directly openly share. What we can also do is in the long term, away from the negotiation table, is develop the relationship so we can um, help the others understand that what we are trying to do is not a zero sum game, but we want to do a win win game. And so that we try to be trustworthy and so on. And that's what you're doing, obviously. I'm not, I'm not trying to suggest that that's not what you have been doing. But sometimes it's overlooked in, in the discourse that these things are not only good in general, but also good because they help us have a negotiation partner who opens up and who shares the, the things that they really care about. One third concept for creating value. So the first has been log rolling, looking at priorities, what is really important for whom. The second is looking at um, what is important for them versus what are they saying. One third concept now is simply adding issues. If you're negotiating about coal power plant, you might chip in other things, you know, like a museum or like a public statement or like um, a speech by the prime minister who you know, discusses the history of the coal people and shows genuine respect for, for this history. Um, or if you, you, if you are, to use a very different example, if you're on a job contract negotiation, you don't only need to focus on the money part, that's what we often do, you can focus on many, many other things. I just want to show a couple of them here. You see the slides online, or you can do a screenshot of them. These are a couple of things that we can negotiate other than salary. So the third way to creating value is to add issues. These three concepts that we have talked about are used in this checklist. That's also one thing that you find online in the course materials. So that's something that you can print out or use in a digital version if you go into a negotiation. Um, there are these three questions that address these three tools for creating value. You also might want to remind yourself of using anchoring and using framing, or if you don't want to use it, of identifying it when the other party uses it. But this is often more easy for people than the value creation techniques. That's why it's not included in the list here. Also, one thing that is recommended is that you ask yourself a couple of questions to check your assumptions. Because as homo sapiens, we are so good at making conclusions um, without having the right data for it. We walk into a room and think, oh, I know these people, I know what they want and so on. And we don't ask questions and don't check it. And often we realize, at least I personally realize, a long time after the negotiation, I had misunderstandings. Um, yeah. So this is a checklist that you might want to use to transfer some of the tools that, you, um, that we are covering here to your, to your work. Before we move on to the Q&A session, I would like to show a couple of characteristics that make negotiations in your fields and in politics and diplomacy in general more complicated than negotiations with our friends, for instance. I don't know if that applies 100% to your job context, um, but um, yeah, I think it applies to many many concepts, more contexts. So we spoke about interests and about identifying interests, the interests of the two daughters with the orange, for instance. In health and climate, what we talk about is individual interests on the one hand, but also public interests. And that's a complicated term. If you say what is in the public interest of the world or of your country, you might find somebody else who disagrees with you. Yeah? You might say it's clear that we have to do this and that in order to help our climate. And they might say not at all. And here I don't refer to different opinions regarding technology or so, but regarding what is in the interest, well, what is a good climate? Yeah? For some people, that's a very different thing maybe than, than for us. So public interests, they 
need to be constructed. You can make an opinion poll and ask people, but maybe this opinion poll only reflects their positions and not what they really care about. So if you poll today citizens, you might find their positions not to interest. And then what is about the interests of future generations? Yeah, we can't poll them. So we need to construct these public interests and we will need to be aware that other people also construct these interests and might disagree with us. And we cannot um, convince them with, with pure math that we have identified the right interests. So public interests always remain, remain a bit fuzzy. Also now with COVID, um, there are different opinions between people who believe in science, what kind of measures should be taken. Then one thing in climate negotiations and health negotiations is that negotiators are responsible to many different audiences. And some of these audiences vote, so they're very interesting. Some of these audiences provide money, so they might be even more interesting. And others of these audience, like future generations, they do neither of this, so they often get overheard. You know this, of course, um, just to, to highlight this point here again, to add to the um, discussion of complexity. A scholar, psycho a psychologist from the, from the Netherlands, Fika Haring, she has pointed out that what also is difficult about these public negotiations is that they often concern values. Yeah? So interests, we, we talked about, are um, very important. Sometimes interests are defined as um, concerning scarce resources, like money, power, air, and so on, emissions. And values are a bit more complex because they concern identity. And when people argue about interests, so more these resources-oriented things, they are more cool and more respectful than when we talk about values. So as humans, when we talk about values, we get angry much quicker. And climate and health often has to do with values. And therefore, these negotiations get more angry than pure business negotiations. So we need to anticipate emotional heat. One other aspect regarding international politics and the health um, issues increasingly in climate anyway are international is that obviously there is a lock of strong institutions and a clear rule of law. So negotiators need to take this into account when we do COP conferences. Um, we know already that we cannot force people to play by the rules. So that's one of the reasons why we make them voluntary. And one problem with voluntary agreements is that people might free ride. Yeah? So there is um, the scholar that I mentioned earlier, um, William Nordhaus, who has won the Nobel Prize. And he says that the COP conferences, they are well intended, but they could be even more effective if what he calls climate clubs would be introduced there. So that voluntary countries join together, but then they um, do not only do something that nobody forces them to, they punish other people who don't join them. So there's one paper regarding this also in the online materials. One other aspect concerns diplomatic appraisal culture. So if you're talking in a business-driven context, people are, at least in some countries, more willing to, to use creative approaches and diplomacy. We tend to be very polite and not to offend each other. And this may also harm negotiations sometimes because people feel that they cannot share their real interests or that they cannot come up with new proposals. One last point is in negotiations in climate and health contexts, in politics and diplomacy, there might not only be communication between two parties, but there might also be a parallel communication between these two parties via public channels. So you might speak with somebody and then you might give a state, um, a press statement, and there might be different messages in these two statements. There's an example here from Henry Kissinger. Yeah, so now it's one minute left for this first part. Mm, I would say that we, yeah, now it's officially the Q&A session is starting. So I would say that we transition 
to the Q&A session. And I'm receiving selected questions here by phone from one of the um, Elena's that we have heard about today from one of the um, UNITAR colleagues. So I would just read out a couple of these questions and then provide some answers. And uh, yeah, maybe we can at some point also, yeah, or let, let, let's see. So please give me one moment to look at these questions here. Okay, let me select one of them. There are many interesting questions. So Khadija El Houdi writes, do you think that because of the COVID-19 pandemic, the health issue is now or ever to have a good place in the negotiation priorities? So is it an, op is it an opportunity for health negotiators that COVID-19 is so much on the agenda is the question that I would see here. Um, one second. Yes, so I would say it's an opportunity and it's a threat depending on, on how, we, how we see it. People are very sensitive now for health issues. They have learned a lot of words about health, but they might also be tired and frustrated and angry. Mm. So Khadija, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. I'm not sure if, if it is, yeah, I, if it, I think it is a good place for health negotiations now if we use it in the right way and if we address these issues in ways that make people more frustrated, then it might also be a bad place to do it right now. So it depends on how we do that. I hope that answers your question. Akash Srivastava from India writes, what is the best way to negotiate when loggerhead? Akash, if you're online, could you please help me understand what does loggerhead mean? Please, um, if you hear this, then if you could unmute yourself or is there anybody else who could help me with this question? Now, Ned Ware raised hand. I don't know if that's you then. Yeah, please unmute yourself. Hello. Hello. Yes, sir. I am asking. If a person is lodging it, is, is a position where a person is sitting with just opposite what the other party wants. At that time, how the negotiation will be done? Like the interests are totally different from one another. Um, so you say, how do people negotiate with each other when they have very opposing interests? Yeah. Okay. So here it's recommended to say, okay, they seem to be opposing right now. Um, let's find out more about these interests. Are they really opposing? Yeah. So is it really the interest that we are seeing here or is it the position? And that's often in real life difficult to, to differentiate. If somebody walks into a room and says, this is my interest and they say, okay, I cannot give you this. What we want to do is you want to move beyond what they have said and try to see what is behind it. Are there maybe interests behind these interests? Are there things that we can agree on besides these disagreements? So can I give you something else that might make you as happy as what you have been asking for? And this might take a lot of time. So in this case, if the interests are opposing, I would recommend to look at them as not final interests. Maybe this is to some extent a position that you are seeing from the other party and to dig deeper and to try to understand, okay, what else is in their interest? If I cannot give you this, what else could I give you that makes you happy or even more happy? 
So if you say, somebody says, we need to keep these power plants running, these coal power plants until 2045, and you say, this is not possible, because we have a window of opportunity to do something for our planet. And in 2045, it's too late to do something. So I can't give you this, but we might be able to give you other things. And then try to understand what really matters for them. And maybe you understand, okay, it's not so much about 2045. They are afraid to get unemployed. Yeah, so maybe you can do something about unemployment. I hope this, this answers your question. Um, Annika Posautz asks a question also in this relation, but how do you identify the interest if you only hear the position all the time? Yeah, so if somebody just repeats the position, you might call for a break and then leave the room and talk to third parties and say, I've been talking to this and this party. They are only always repeating their position. What do they really care about? Or you develop 20 creative solutions and present these solutions to them and say, these are just creative brainstorming things. They are not final offers, but which of them would you like to talk about? And sometimes people who only repeat at one point, if you give them 20 proposals, you'll be interested in two or three. And then you start to realize, okay, there is more to what they want than to what they have been saying. Or you might also say, maybe the person at the table is repeating what they have said from the beginning on because they are instructed to do so. Maybe this is not the decision maker. Maybe you are meeting somebody who has a mandate and who has been told to go in the negotiation and has this one talking point. So if you don't get deeper with this person, you might need to find the decision maker. Talk to other people, people above in the hierarchy. Maybe. You might need to go back to them or you might, need to, you might need to ask your counterpart to go back to their capital and come back with a new mandate. You say, so this is a deadlock here. I cannot make any concessions on what you are saying and you don't seem to be making any concessions on what I'm saying. If we want to reach an agreement, um, both of us need to go back. So maybe the problem is that the wrong people are there or that these people have the wrong instructions. Or the people might have the right instructions, but they don't want to. They have a zero sum, uh, they have a fixed mindset, a zero sum mindset. So they don't want to reach an agreement for maybe personal reasons. So here, the important thing is not to give in. Don't buy everything they say. Try to get an outside perspective um, and win time and so on. Okay, Franco Vitali writes, I didn't understand what you meant by climate clubs. Could you please expand? So climate club, that's a concept that is meant to create um, a union of countries who say we want to have a carbon price. And we also want to do investments into renewable energy and climate friendly technology. And the problem that we have is if we have a high carbon price and if we use a lot of money for research and development, our products will be more expensive than the products from another country who has the same level of productivity but lower standards. So therefore it will be to our disadvantage to do this. At the same time, of course, we do something good for the climate. So we will benefit from this because the, the climate um, change gets mitigated, but also the other countries who are not part, who don't do this, they also benefit. So they are, they have, they are free riders. So they have the same, the same climate benefits and lower costs. So what William Nordhaus says is that in these negotiations, it often has been overlooked that there are structural incentives for countries not to really reach an agreement. And the term here that has been used is um, pledge and review. The countries meet and they say, okay, we, we, we find an agreement and then we um, present a, history, a victory, but there is no incentive to really then um, act based on these agreements. And in a climate club, you say nobody has to join, we meet, and then the countries who are not part of the club, there will be a little tariff on their products, not to punish them, not to harm them, just to create a fairness on the market that our products are not more expensive than their products. 
And this could be apl applied to climate. It could also be applied to social standards, for instance. There's this concept called race to the bottom. If one country has high social standards, the other country has low social standards. Both of them use the same technology, have the same level of productivity. There is an incentive um, for both countries to lower their social standards because of the international competition. So there was a paper by Nobel Prize winning, winning economist, um, Mr. Nordhaus on this, also on the, the documents that I shared. Now, Albert Blatherwick writes, do you think dealing with climate change and COP26 will be made harder due to COVID-19? Mm, I think it really depends on how the climate and health community is playing their hand. So, so this is similar to the question before. Um, the citizens are tired, yes, so that's a reason why they might not listen, but everybody understands that things are serious and everybody understands that things can be changed. We could change a lot of things now in COVID. Why shouldn't it also be possible for the climate? So it is both an opportunity and a risk. And let's see the opportunity side in, in this. Rajesh Kumar Prasad writes, how do we move forward in a negotiation when one side doesn't want to negotiate? That's one of the classic questions that is very, very relevant, very often asked. And here the recommendation is to make the negotiation about mm -hmm. them. Don't tell them what you want. Tell them what they can get if they negotiate with you. Don't say you have to stop with these practices because I want that. And they say, oh, I don't want to even talk to you. Say, if we talk here, you will be able to get these and these things. It's not money or so, but something, you know, um, a better word for their children, you know, um, a country with a higher uh, life expectations. This is interesting for politicians who want to be reelected. Think about why this is interesting for them. So in negotiations, we, so there are different ways of decision-making with groups. One is to force something onto other people. That's if you are in a position of hierarchy, if you are a parent, you can do that, or if you are a king. But negotiations is mostly about finding agreements when people are at the same level. And then you cannot just force people. So you have to convince them that they will get something, even if they will also lose something. So they have to give up some practices, but they will gain something and put their attention on what they will be able to gain and make the negotiation about them. I know this sounds way easier than it is in real life, yeah, as with many negotiation concepts, but this is the way that I want to start. If you were in their shoes, when would you like to negotiate with Rajesh Kumar? What will Rajesh Kumar need to offer you that you would listen to them? Then a question from Humayan Kabir. How can a negotiator mediate associated conflicts during negotiation process? So if we have many parties, as for instance in the COP negotiations, we might have conflicts between other parties and that's when mediation comes in. So mediation has been called assisted negotiation so that two people don't reach an agreement and then third parties come in. Sometimes a negotiator can help others but sometimes it might also be good to say, we need somebody who is as neutral as possible. Nobody is ever 100% neutral, um, but we would have to be, have someone coming from the outside, a former diplomat, a former head of state, an uncle in a family context, so that the roles don't overlap so much. If you are a negotiator and a mediator at the same time, people might think that you have a conflict of interest here. Mediation is a field that is much huger than negotiation because they use all the negotiation tools and then thousands of other psycho, um, um, psychological and communication related and um, media related um, concepts. I'm not an expert on mediation, but one thing that I can say is that it's important to, to be clear in the, the, in the roles here. Then Selena Lopreno writes, when seeing that many Western governments have cut their budget on the environmental sector due to the economic crisis related to the pandemic, 
it seems complicated to make good progress in the health and environment sector. How can we convince governments to secure a budget in this matter? So there is not one clear answer to this, um, obviously. So I think you are asking for some spontaneous ideas here. Again, I would say, make it about them. What is the interest of the government? Yeah. It's to be reelected. It's to be leading a healthy country and find ways to, to say what, um, why these things will be good for them and not good for their critics yeah, who say that they are not doing enough. Because if they feel that it's only good for their critics, then they don't want to do it. So how can we convince them? So we, look at, we should look at their, at their interests. And maybe one thing that they're afraid of is that they might, it might hurt the country economically if they now spend additional money. So how can we have better health care and better climate without these economic disadvantages? And think about concepts um, for this. So climate change should not be, it, it may cost money, but it should not be to the disadvantage, the financial disadvantage. So maybe here this climate club thing would be interesting. I know that this is not a satisfying answer. This is maybe just one little idea of what could be tried. Mm. At the same time, if I had the answer for this, then um, I might already have to have shared that. Florencia Pukoi Sain. Hello, I'm Florencia from Argentina. Could you explain the diplomatic appraisal culture point again? Here I, meant that, here I meant that in business, if you have an idea and it's um, wrong, you might face criticism, but if it's right, you might get a lot of benefits from this. You might get promote it very quickly. So people in business, the business world, they often take more risks yeah, because they, they have more to gain. In diplomacy, at least from, from what I read, it's often the main goal is not to offend anybody or to come across as, uh, as, as too crazy with ideas. That's, my, that's why people in business develop things like Google and Facebook. And in diplomacy, the innovation rate might be a little bit lower. Not because the people there are less skilled, not at all, but because they operate in a different environment. Of course, this is generalizing. There are diplomatic services where innovation is um, held very high, where people are encouraged, and where young diplomats, if they have great ideas, they, they, they can become senior diplomats quickly. But in many diplomatic services, age is what gives you the promotion much more than um, creative ideas. Muindi from Nairobi, Kenya. What effect does using a lot of facts and statistics have on the other party during negotiations? And will it lead to an agreement? That's, that's, that's a great question. Um, it really depends on the people. So for some people, you give them the facts and they start to agree with you. Other people, you give them the facts and they, they're not impressed because they have their own facts. And then you say, but my facts are much more relevant. You know, they are from more renowned researchers. Um, and you say 97% of the climate researchers agree on things. And then they give you a study from one of the, the few people who disagree on that. So cognitive learning does not always happen if you provide people with data. And even if they do, even if you tell the smoker, you should stop smoking, it's bad for your health. They might agree, but still they cannot change. So changing often, you need to go beyond facts. You need to go to the heart and the gut of the people and understand what is holding them back. And so this might have to do with hidden interests that they have. Mm. So I would use good data, but understand that, that data is not always convincing. It should be, but it's not that you get a profile of your counterpart. Are these people convinced by data? If yes, if they have heard about what I want to say before, 
it's hard to meet somebody who says that climate change is not really who, uh, who is not real, who has never heard about studies that say that it's real. So often they're not, they're not lacking data. They're, there's some other issue. Catherine Patricks writes, how do I negotiate with authorities that have no full knowledge of what I'm negotiating for? Yeah, so sometimes we need to educate before we negotiate or we need to find a negotiation partner who can educate the others or mediate. So if you're talking about health issues and they are not understanding basic concepts here, then it might be good not to start the negotiation, say we need to do this first. We need to agree on a couple of facts here. It's hard to give a general recommendation for the one thing that will always work here but I would say that it's important to address this issue, that you respectfully say, we need to talk about some facts here before we can make an agreement. Okay, other questions here from Sarira Alaydres. I hope I pronounced that. I'm sure I don't pronounce it correctly, but I hope it's, uh, it's, it's getting close, closer to it. Sarira from Indonesia. Can you share your experience in negotiation when it comes to unwilling your counterpart's interests? As one might share their, as one might share theirs implicitly in the negotiation table for various reasons, i.e. being cautious. So my experience with unwilling your counterpart's interests. Mm, So one main thing I think here is it takes time. It takes time for the other party often to understand what their interest is. Um, because we as, as human beings, we're so focused on positions and interests are so complex and there might be interests that we are not proud of, you know, um, that we are afraid of something or so. So with identifying interests is take a lot of time. And maybe they start with an hypothesis of what their of what their interest is. But then if you talk about it for two hours, they get a different understanding and the same might happen for you. You might think my interest is here, I want to help these people. And then you understand, okay, but also what really matters is that our organization looks good in this process. So maybe that's something that you're not proud of. You think you're only caring about the content, not so much about yourself. But if you're honest, this also plays a role. So my experience is it really is like peeling an onion, getting closer and closer. And you also make some detours. And therefore creating trust is so important. If people, and maybe the, the second part of your question addresses this, if somebody is cautious, so often people don't want to share this and you might need to at some point say, okay, I think we have got a bit closer to our interests. Let's take a break here. Maybe you need to sleep over it. They need to sleep over it. So one thing is sure, if somebody says we cannot do something because it costs too much money, this is not their final interest. That's always an argument that is often used because money is so ubiquitous in our world, but people, there's always something behind money and, and it might take them and you a lot of time to understand what that is. Tusha Pratan writes, in a negotiation process where there are multi stakeholders with multiple interests, how does the principles of negotiation apply? Hmm. As each one will try to gain more for others, what can be the most amicable solution? Yeah, again, a very relevant question. So multi-party contexts, how does the negotiation, how do the negotiation principle apply? My impression is that they apply and then there are some other things involved. So things like possibility for misunderstandings, um, possibilities to gain power by using coalitions, then in these coalitions, the possibility that there are disagreements, you need to negotiate within your group, an intra-team negotiation, and then you need to negotiate 
with others. So I would say that the same context, the same principles apply, interest versus position, anchoring and so forth. But then other things also are relevant that we are not addressing so much here in this course. And that Patricia who works for the multilateral diplomacy unit of UNITA um, is probably dealing with on a daily basis. Uh, Okay, so now we just have a couple of minutes left. I don't know, is there maybe one question, one, one more question that we could talk about? I, I've only been looking at my telephone here where I received selected questions. We could look at the Q&A or maybe for the last question, we might also have somebody from the participant group who would like to unmute herself or himself and ask the question directly. Rafael Lacau raised uh, his hand, so Rafael, you can go ahead. Please, Rafael. Hi, Patricia, Valentin. Thanks very much again for this opportunity. Um, just a, a very quick question. Um, why do you think climate negotiations of today are, are highly contentious? I mean, the, the Montreal Protocol before is uh, perhaps a relatively success story then why can't governments now pull off a similar effort to address the climate emergency? Thank you. So is this question to me why I think that they are highly consensus? Um, yes, I think I didn't make that point before. Yes, um, sorry, Valentin, if I didn't make myself clear. So I just want to know your thoughts. So based on the concepts that we have learned from the webinar today, why do you think that climate negotiations of today are highly contentious? Um, well, before like the Montreal Protocol, it's relatively a success story, but now addressing the climate emergency, maintaining that 1.5 degrees Celsius, not going overboard that, it's, it's very difficult to, for, for governments to address it and pull it off a similar effort. Um, why do you think uh, is causing that contention for today? Hmm. I'm not sure if I'm the expert to answer this question. Hmm, there might be so many factors. Um, so yeah, that's that's my answer. My answer would be, it's not one reason, it's probably many. Hmm. And I, 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 I couldn't say now from the top of my head, which are the top reasons in my perception. Maybe you would like to, to offer um, a couple of ideas on this, if I may ask, Raphael. Well, on top of my head, nothing really uh, comes very quickly right now, apart from thinking of the political side from, uh, of course, we're, we're talking about um, multilateral negotiations here, many heads talking to each other, achieving, trying to achieve a common goal. So, um, sorry, I didn't mean to put you on the spot. I just asked um, just because I find it uh, very interesting because um, before, like what I said earlier, the Montreal Protocol, I see that as a success story. Mm. Meaning us humans, we're, we were able to do something successful in the area of climate change, uh, in the area of climate negotiations. But mm. now with the negotiations of the 1.5 degrees Celsius, um, it's very difficult for national governments to address that. And um, I don't know, apart from political reasons or the economic um, advantages, disadvantages you have spoken a while ago, um, I can think of other reasons as well. You, you can't think or you can't think? I, I can't. Negative. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's why I wanted to know more based on, on the concepts that you have explained from today. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I'm very sorry that I, that I cannot offer any sharp answer here. Um, and, and before I try unsuccessfully, I would like to um, leave, leave it as like, like this. But thank you for this, for this very important question, Rafael. Yeah, sure, no problem, thanks. Thank you, Rafael, for your question. As you were mentioning, climate change is a cross-cutting thing. It has many implications, political, economic, and social. Uh, so today's webinar is uh, the aim of today's webinar is to, to discuss about uh, the negotiation dynamics in negotiation. We're going to have a second webinar and a more advanced topic on the um, 
on the um, uh, current uh, challenges of um, of uh, multi-party negotiations on climate change negotiations. So the webinar will take place on 15th June, at the same time. So you're more than welcome to uh, to join us and uh, and ask the the experts who will attend this this webinar. Um, so we have uh, reached out the time limit. So it's now at 4:30 here in Geneva. So I would like to to thank you, Bao, for um, for your valuable feedback and and input about negotiations, because uh, the knowledge you share with us today can be applied to any context, whether it's on climate change and health negotiations or even our professional private life. And we we'll want to go to a trip somewhere, etc. So thank you so much, uh, uh, Val, and uh, thank you also to all the participants for joining us today and and for your questions and also for uh, your positive feedback that you posted on the chat box. It was a truly a pleasure to to have you with us uh, today. Uh, unfortunately, due to the time limit, we were not able to answer all the questions. Uh, however, as is mentioning, uh, you, you have uh, the opportunity to register for the e-learning course on climate change um, and negotiations on health that will officially start today. My colleagues have shared the registration link on the chat box. And also you can register for the second webinar as part of this course that will take place on 15th uh, June. My colleagues will share with you the registration link in the chat box as well in a, in a minute. Um, the, this second webinar, was, as I was mentioning before, uh, I was explaining to, to Rafael, it's on current challenges on multi-party negotiation on climate uh, change negotiations on health. Um, and last but not least, I would also like to thank uh, all the panelists and especially to WHO and US Science and Learn for their continuous support and for launching um, collaboration with UNITAR, this e-learning course in climate change negotiations and health. So, so the aim of, of this course is to strengthen the understanding of the interlinkages between climate change and health, and also to support delegates so they can uh, prepare more effectively for the um, upcoming uh, 26th session of the, of the COP, as well as other professionals, you know, who are involved in the development and implementation of national climate change and health uh, policies. So uh, thank you all again, and I wish you um, a nice afternoon. And hopefully we look forward to welcoming you in our next webinar on 15th June, as well as, um, as our, as our e-learning course. Um, if you can stay for one or two more minutes, we're going to share with you the uh, valuation um, in case you can take it. It won't take more than two minutes, I promise. It's only like a couple of questions, but your feedback is really valuable for us because it can help us improve our training activities in the, in the future. Um, so, yeah, so thank you all again. Thanks, everybody.